Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Mirvali. My friends, there's still a lot of papal discussion uh, going around, and that's a good thing. So let's talk about the papacy again. We've talked about this recently. I've uh, got some just great questions from some of you uh, viewers, and I'm always grateful when you send stuff in. And I'm always happy to uh, include it in Mary Live when it's relevant and when I can do so. So just for review, uh, in fact, the liturgical readings have uh, done a great job of preparing us for this papal discussion. So a few weeks ago, we had Matthew 16, 15 through 20, which we know is where Jesus establishes the papacy. Jesus says to Simon Barjona, Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. The jaws of death or the gates of hell, depending on translation, will not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declare loosed shall be loosed. Whatever you declare bound shall be bound. Okay, so, and that's a gross paraphrase, but you get the idea. This is Jesus establishing the rock of the church, the foundation of the church on the office of Peter and Peter's successors. This is where we get infallibility from. Uh, why? Because Jesus promises to back the decisions of a man. He can't do that unless he protects that man and the office that the man occupies from error. It's very simple. And so infallibility is where the Pope is protected from error regarding all solemn or ordinary matters uh, in, in the category of faith and morals. Okay, So that's the rock. That's what makes us Catholic in terms of knowing where the truth is protected. And this is, a, this is critically important. Uh, I'm going to go, for, go over a couple of great questions that, uh, again, that the, you listeners have, have brought forward. Uh, one will be, uh, well, if this person's calling that person a schismatic and that person's calling this person a schismatic, how do we know who's a schismatic? And the answer will be simple. The person who's with the vicar of Christ on faith and morals can't be called schismatic. Uh, the person, for whatever reason, is uh, opposing the Holy Father on matters of faith and morals. That is dangerously uh, proximate to a break, uh, a separation, which is the word what the word schism means. Okay, and then we go to Matthew 16, 21 and following, and this is the great rebuke. And we talked about this in a previous program as well. Jesus calls Peter Satan. Notice how the context of what takes place here. Peter brings Jesus aside. Peter doesn't turn to the apostles and say, I'm going to start a new teaching that Jesus cannot die and be resurrected. And in fact, technically, the, the, the full office of Peter isn't instituted until after the, the resurrection of Jesus and, and the beautiful exchange of Jesus and Peter about feeding the lambs and feeding the sheep, etc. But what this tells us very clearly is while the Pope is infallible, he's not impeccable. The Pope can sin. The Pope does sin. Every Pope has sinned. Why? Because the Pope is a human being. His office protecting him from error does not prevent him and take away his freedom. And, you know, we have to be careful here because sometimes as we examine the faults of others, it can be a, a bit of an escape of examining ourselves, our own investigation of how we're doing in the spiritual life. And I'm not using this as a red herring to the discussion of the papacy. I'm simply saying that's a reality. You know, speaking with a very holy bishop, uh, recently, and he said this, this new cancel culture, it's so focused on pointing fingers to someone else's error and asking reparation for it without ever examining self. And that's a very dangerous cultural uh, dimension, uh, a direction uh, focus is pointing out the, the, the faults of others, either presently or historically, and of course, we make distinctions. Of course, we've got to remember things like the evils of slavery and, and, the, and the, the horrid, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the 
the dynamic horror of things like the Holocaust. It's a whole nother thing, though, to take on as a habit to perpetually and consistently focus on the sins of others, the weaknesses of others. And we all have to be careful of that. So the Pope is protected from error solemnly and on matters of faith and morals, uh, even in the ordinary fashion. And secondly, the Holy Father sins uh, and he uh, needs conversion like everybody else. So with that basis, let's go over a couple uh, uh, questions, great questions that were sent in. Uh, one is, what is conciliarism? Okay, the conciliarism has many names. It's called Episcopalism, Gallicanism, as it continued in the in the Church in France. Essentially, conciliarism is the idea that if the bishops together decide that they don't want a particular pope, that the, the bishops have the power to remove the pope, and this is simply an error. Uh, this, has tried, this has been tried at various times in, in history, like Council of Basile in, in the 15th century. And of course, the bishops together don't have that power. Use the analogy of Jesus and the apostles. What if all the apostles agreed that Jesus was wrong, uh, or even that they didn't want Jesus? Would they have the power to take away Christ? Of course, it's nonsense, right? Well, the same thing is true about the vicar of Christ. This is an office instituted by Jesus that Jesus protects. And so bishops cannot claim an authority to overthrow the proper authority of the Holy Father. Okay, uh, another question, excellent question. This is from Mark on the West Coast. Uh, what about jurisdiction? That is to say, granted, the Pope is infallible, Faith and morals, both solemnly and, and, and most hold or in the ordinary magisterial teaching. Uh, what about jurisdiction over things like discipline? Does the Pope have jurisdiction over discipline? And uh, it's a great question. So let me read from, uh, bear with me, I hate to read to you, but just this is important because this comes from Vatican I, and it's very clear on the jurisdiction of the Holy Father. And Vatican I says, uh, and I quote, If anyone shall say that the Roman pontiff has the office merely of inspection and direction and not a full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, not only in things which belong to faith and morals, but also in those which relate to the discipline and government of the church spread throughout the world, or assert that he possesses merely the principal part and not all of the fullness of this supreme power, or that this power which he enjoys is not ordinary and immediate, both over each and all the churches and over each and all the pastors and the faithful, let him be anathema, which was the way they would tend to end these dogmatic statements in Trent and Vatican I. So, now that's not to say necessarily that the Pope is infallible with every disciplinary application, but it is to say it's his authority. It's his jurisdiction. And certainly anything that is proximate to faith and morals, the Holy Father is protected from error by the Holy Spirit. So great question from Mark on that. Um, okay, a question about schismatics. Uh, this was uh, brought up uh, uh, by Kathy on the East Coast. What do you do when some of the church say, well, you're schismatic, and others point back and say, no, well, no, you're schismatic. Um, do we just go to Jesus as our rock? Well, the problem with that is you've got 33,000 Christian denominations in the United States alone, that hold that Jesus is their rock. But they have 33,000 different varieties of Christianity. So the answer is, no, you go to Peter. If one is being faithful to Peter, to the successor of Peter, to the vicar of Christ, to the Holy Father, to the Pope, on matters of faith and morals, you cannot be considered schismatic because 
To be schismatic is precisely to separate from Peter, from the Holy Father on matters of faith and morals. And look, we've talked about this before. Let me bring it up again. This doesn't include the Pope's personal opinion on things of medicine, uh, statements about you know, the, the importance of vaccines. Uh, and it's not a popularity contest. It's not whether you like the personality of a given Holy Father. And clearly, it's not based on, once again, impeccability. Whether the Pope sins, whether they be little sins or big sins, the office of Peter is what protects the unity of the church. As Ambrose says, St. Ambrose, where Peter is, there is the church. Okay, just one more question. Good, this is from uh, John of the South. Uh, is it possible for the Pope to commit such a, a, a large sin? Uh, he said, you know, an extremely mortal sin. Uh, once it's mortal, it's mortal. But a large sin, uh, you know, a grandiose sin, so much so that it would impede, it would prevent the Holy Spirit protecting the Pope from making an error in faith and morals. And this is an easy one. The answer is simply no. Doesn't matter what the Pope does personally. No, of course, we never want to encourage or applaud uh, or, or, or see as something in any way positive when a priest sins, whether it be a local clergy or a bishop or a cardinal or a pope. It always hurts. But let's keep, again, in mind, let's go before the ecclesiastical mirror ourselves. Uh, we have to look at ourselves. Uh, we, we've all done things that we are ashamed of. We've all done things that we wouldn't have done had we a second chance to not do them. Um, but that's the process of conversion. That's being fallen human, seeking holiness through grace, which is a gift that we have to cooperate with. So, it's in no sense to lessen uh, the, the, the difficulty when uh, a, a bishop or especially a holy father uh, is, is you know, accused of a sin or, or something great. But it simply is irrelevant to the issue of the spirit protecting his office. Now, you know, history helps us with this, just as we have historical cases of groups of bishops trying to you know, boot the Holy Father, which they cannot do. They don't have the power to do. Conciliarism. We've got many cases. Uh, there's a fairly extensive line of uh, Renaissance popes. Um, we'll choose just one. For example, Alexander the Sixth, who acknowledged that he had several illegitimate children through several different mistress, uh, mistresses. Do we applaud that? Of course we don't applaud it. It's very sad. It's very unfortunate. But it doesn't rock, shake, intimidate our faith in the office of Peter. Because history shows that even with someone with Alexander VI, he never sought to change church's teaching on sexual morality in terms of the, the intrinsic evil of uh, premarital sex, of, of uh, you know uh, breaking the vows of celibacy. And so... It's almost a stronger case that the Holy Spirit protects the church and truth. This is the promise of Jesus. Look, Jesus would make the promise of protecting uh, the church and truth and backing the Holy Father if he didn't know that he had the ability to do it. He's kind of God. God can do these things. And the Holy Spirit can protect the church until the end of time even with human beings, including fallible human beings in the office of papacy. So, once again, just to get our kind of our, 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 our papal ABCs set, our, our Pope 101, the Pope is infallible on faith and morals, both solemnly and in the ordinary teaching most withhold. Secondly, the Pope can sin um, and does sin and needs conversion. Thirdly, no group of bishops can remove the vicar of Christ, validly elected. And fourthly, the Pope does have jurisdiction even over matters of church discipline, even beyond faith and morals. Okay. And I hope, in a fifth sense, we have a peace about the rock that Jesus Christ gave you and gave me 
so we can be Catholic without confusion. We don't have to uh, determine our fidelity based on every blogging headline or even everything that will come from the Senate. I should mention briefly, I had another question and said, I so appreciate your comments, etc. Uh, what's a synod? So uh, t- just every, ever so briefly, so the, a synod in general uh, is can be a meeting of bishops to discuss matters pertinent to the church. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In this particular case, there's a three-part synod going on of sorts, where part one was having every diocese of the world submit questions uh, worthy of consideration. Uh, part two is the bishops meeting in Rome and some lady as well. And that happens October 4th through the 21st, if I remember correctly, or 24th in 2023. And there will be a part three of this synod where the bishops will come again together. But ultimately, ultimately, any decision rests on the Vicar of Christ. It's up to the Holy Father to uh, confirm anything in faith and morals or to confirm any new discipline, which once again, with Vatican I, is under his jurisdiction. So to be concerned is perfectly legitimate. To have it threaten your Catholic faith, that's to misunderstand what Jesus gives us when he gives us the office of the papacy. So let's continue in peace. Let's continue in prayer, both for our Holy Father, for the best possible outcome of the Synod. Uh, And remember that the Holy Spirit doesn't fail and Jesus doesn't lie when they promise us a church that will be here in truth until the end of time. Thanks be to God. What an incredible honor and privilege it is to be Catholic. Thanks for being with us. God bless you all.